everyone this is going to be a video about Fubini's theorem and what goes into the proof of Fubini's theorem it's actually quite important and make the student really think and in every one way if you just tie it up to it simply to the volume it seems like very simple statement but if one thinks about um, what the definition of a volume is then um, it's puzzling and then it um, motivates us to think about um, how do we actually establish this fact? So let us start with the definition of double integral. So double integral starts like this, very similar to the Riemann sum over one variable integral. Of course, we start this entire video is, is about this rectangular region. So here's a rectangular region, and then we divide this rectangular region into tiny pieces like this. It looks quite a big chunk like that, so that we can see. Uh, closely, but it's supposed to be a very, very tiny piece. The x coordinate is labeled like this x subscript k. Y coordinate of these two points here is labeled y subscript j there. And like the Riemann sum of one variable, we have an arbitrary choice from that each piece in here, which we call the starred point. And the y increment is denoted by this delta yj. And x part of the increment is denoted by the delta xk. So we have many, many pieces of these tiny rectangles are inside in here. Part of this big rectangle is partitioned. An important thing is that the width and the height of this tiny rectangle is not the same at all. It's very irregular partition. And the points inside here is an arbitrary point. And all these free choices actually make this definition actually powerful. Once we have those domain down there, rectangular domain, partitioned, and then we have a choice of a, uh, points for each of the tiny rectangles, we evaluate those points with the function f and can compute the volume of this tiny building, that is tiny piece of rectangle there, and using this height then the summing up all the volumes of these tiny buildings, counting the sign here, if it is a positive, it's positive, if it is negative, it's negative. That sum, the limit of that sum is the Riemann, the, the double integral. So let me show you the picture. It's like this, those are tiny, you know, buildings put it together and it's kind of showing that the surface is creating that surface. It's supposed to be the graph of z equals f of x, y. We're pointing here. All right. So this is not approximating, and we're about to define the volume of a certain solid. And that's how mathematicians do the business. you got, you got to define it first. So I'm going to move up that tiny building over there and then state that some of the um, volumes, since there are just two indices there in k and j, and the number of partition along that x side and along the y side, they don't have to be equal to each other. So that's why it's n and m are different. And delta a k delta a k j is the product of these two. This is supposed to be j there. It's a typo. So this product, so that's the area at the bottom. And then height we are using here is the function value f at that arbitrary choice, the point. So that is the notation for the sum of the volumes of the tiny buildings. Important part to point out here is that um, when we take the limit, the choices we're involved here is not just simply n and m are approaching infinity. It's not that simple. It's this choice of a partition. How are we going to divide this into tinier and tinier pieces? The way we do that is completely free as long as we're, you know, we're getting smaller and smaller and choice of these points inside here, every time you partition, you can change it as long as that point is inside this rectangle, uh, little tiny rectangular region. So there are many, many choices up here. For all those choices, we're considering this limit, right? So it's very difficult to actually calculate anything with this one. It's actually it's impossible. You have to mathematically argue um, a different way. But this is how we defined it. So the final bit, over all these crazy choices, if there is a common value 
which doesn't depend on which partition you choose forever. There's always the same number. If this all of this thing approaches the same common value v, then we say the integral exists. So I summarize it over here, and the notation goes like this. When that v exists and v is denoted by this double integral symbol. This is not the two integrals operation put together. This is not that, it's just a symbol with R subscript in it. And dA is kind of um, imitating this delta AK, but again, this is just notation. It's not like dA multiplied there. All right? It's just this, um, this is notation for that double integral we just defined. This is a theorem, just like the Riemann sum theorem. If the function is continuous in a sense as a two variable function, then this um, double integral exists. Continuous over the rectangular region, this double integral exists. That's the, that's the theorem. And proving this one is really a lot of work, it's just like the one variable. Those are not usually done in calculus, or um, you have to go all the way up to advanced calculus to see the proof of it. This continuous condition is very sometimes very difficult to deal with so often it gets very topological and those topological argument is not accessible for calculus students or calculus one two three level students. So the whole point of this video making me video uh, creating video like this is that the standard proof is given for this continuous condition um, having this difficulty of uh, presenting the proof to the students because it in involves this topological flavor in it. So I changed the flavor um, the condition of f to the plausible condition like you know f has continuous partial. Those are the usually the thing that showed up, you know, condition that is we we have for the calculus three level. So we're gonna change some of the things we want to prove this one to f as a continuous partial, right? But we will not prove this re this result, of it, I'm pointing it here, even with a continuous partial. This is involves not only topological argument, but it had, we have to look at a sequences and a Cauchy sequences and, you know, things of that nature. It's, it's just too much to build up to it. So I'm, you know, waving my hands on this one, and then we will simply accept this one, f is continuous, then this double integral exists. But we're going to focus on the Fubini's theorem, all right? But at least we're going to look at this example um, for which the double integral doesn't exist. If it's a continuous, it's going to exist, right? That was the theorem. So this must not be continuous. And let me show you why this one's not continuous. So here's why. Usually it's the denominator, who's the culprit x plus y is going to be 0 on this line, y equals uh, negative x, so that's the line. The rectangle we're looking at, I forgot to specify what that is, r here is 0 to 1, and 0 to 1, usual square box. The only intersection is this y with this line y plus x here is this corner point. Other than that, these um, everywhere here on this rectangle square this function is defined. One thing to notice here is these two points. If this is a comma b and the other point is uh, going to be b comma a, which is a reflection about this y equals x. And for those two points, this function value is exactly the same except the sign. So the function value here and function value there is opposite sign. That is to remain true for every point except this 0 comma 0. So if we integrate this one over, you know, if we get rid of a little bit part of here, which is um, symmetric, then this integral will actually be uh, flat 0. Okay? But it is this part that's going to cause the problem. So the beginning of this um, definition of the double integral starts with the Riemann sum, and the Riemann sum, the, the first part is this partition of this rectangle. So we're going to introduce one way of partitioning it. It's a partition method one. We're going to do the usual uniform partition, right? So this horizontal and vertical part is going to be divided into exactly the same length. 
and we're going to choose the point for each of this tiny uh, square part this time is we're going to use this midpoint rule right in the middle so it's going to look like this if the square happened to be off this line then these uh, the point over here and the point over there is going to be exactly symmetric you can always divide it equally in this way if we happened that we have a square that is on that uh, dotted line y equals x then this function value there is actually zero y equals x so it has to be zero and these two function values um, cancel each other and that's exactly the same base size so they're going to cancel off and most of the time and we have to be careful with that point right there, 0 comma 0. So here is our 0 comma 0 right there. And this is the square that contains that 0 comma 0 right there. Okay. So what about this one? That is still going to pass through this dotted line with this um, a comma a kind of point. Therefore, the function value at that point is going to be 0. So we kind of prove that the Riemann sum not only approaches anything, it's always constant to 0 if we divide this um, square in a, in a uniform way with a midpoint rule. So it's written here. So notice that there's nn. We divide exactly in the same length. And we chose the midpoint right in there. And this is going to be flat 0. Therefore, the limit is 0. So according to this division partition, that's going to be 0. Now this partition method 2 is kind of the same uniform partition of each of the sides that creates all these rectangles exactly the same but we're going to go to that bottom left corner and choose some do something else so here it is if i choose if i look at this bottom left corner we chose midpoint but just for that corner that just for that box i'm going to choose this x1 i realize that it does something different all right so that should be labeled one one point the very you know, first on the x side and the first interval in the y, y side so we usually write it x11 so that's the point we chose x1 there and y11 it's a zero point this is the point where it's not undefined but let's compute the function value at that point x1 comma 0 so x10 goes there x1 comma 0 x1 comma 0 this is ready to a third power so all together is x1 squared in the denominator Right, that's the function value. Now if you go to here to the Riemann sum, everything was zero except that one tiny up in um, you know, lower left corner. So that one, the function value was one over x1 squared, and the area of that piece is you know is x1 squared, right? So therefore it remained that that value right there. If you happen to choose that value, it remains one all the time. So the entire Riemann sum here remains one all the time if you keep dividing it this way and keeping especially choose a different point for that one particular uh, piece so it proves that uh, there's a two different way of a partitioning it and if you refine it further and further this Riemann sum approaches different way I think it's a very good example to you know appreciate what the you know real meaning of, of the the Riemann sum especially the the choice of the points we're making here okay often this Riemann sum is introduced with this left end point with one variable example left end point or right end point it is introduced this way to to understand what is trying to measure and something like that and later on this more general definition is introduced and this general definition is important to make a change of variable and do all sorts of different operations uh, to we want to kind of verify using this very definition on uh, substitution rule and um, integration by part all those things if we have this general definition everything um, we use can be justified nicely or in other words I have to put it if we start with the left end point uh, Riemann sum definition or at least to show that it's for the continuous function these definitions are equivalent the understanding that much is the key part and therefore it is it is this important part of the um, understanding the Riemann sum um, the namely 
the understanding, this choice of points we have a freedom we have for each interval, in this case, is this for each piece of the rectangle involved in here. Okay? So I was talking about uh, one variable calculus. In one variable calculus, like integral and differential calculus, we actually um, introduce the definition of the volume. What we just introduced the double integral is really the definition of the volume. Okay, so let's um, take a look at that. All right, here it is. Uh, let's look at the Calc 3 again. Calc 3, we're looking at the graph of a two-variable function and volume underneath it. And that's how we looked at, um, and then we looked at these buildings, uh, what I call. But here's how we did in Calc 2. We start with a solid, not necessarily the graph of a function or anything. It's just a solid like this. And then we use this uh, axis of cross-section. And there's this x-axis going through. And this cross-section is the intersection of a plane that is perpendicular to this cross of uh, axis of cross-section with this solid. So if you cut this um, solid with that perpendicular plane, then it's going to generate this irregular shape like that. Not necessarily a circle, but what we did in Calc 2, we dealt with a circle so that we can calculate it. But the idea was generally introduced like this. Here's a cross section. Not only we look at this cross section like that, we actually introduce a little, you know, uh, volume like this, a very thin slides. So we're going to cut it in and assume the side part right there and right there is a uh, vertical or horizontal to us. So that is a very shallow cylinder. So the volume of this little tiny piece is the base area, which is denoted by AX here, times the height, which is um, must be delta X because that's the, the way the X uh, axis is oriented. So if you add up all of these tiny pieces, it must be a good approximation to the volume we are staring at. it. But it's actually the way we defined it. Uh, we have to define it before we think about approximation. So this is the first time that appeared in the calculus series. So this must be our uh, Calc 2, one variable definition of a volume of a solid. And this is a different way of uh, ever doing the business, if you think about it. There's a large chunk involved, and here's a very tiny chunk involved in here. I don't know how to say it, but it's actually different. It is worth making this connection here. So we use this method, integrating this area, cross-section area, along the axis of cross-section. That must be the volume. So I wrote it up here and organized it. This is a Calc 2 method, and this is Calc 3 method. So here it is. We're going to apply this uh, Calc 2 method, uh, the same method, to Calc 3 situation. The Calc 3 situation is not like the solid like this. There is a, it is a solid, but it's a slightly different formulation. We have a graph of a function, z equals f of x, y. It could possibly stretch to infinity and here and there. But we gave this little rectangular box underneath it and created this kind of cylinder where the top is not like flat. It's a curvy surface over there. So we have uh, defined the, the volume of this one using this double integral, but let's apply Calc 2 method. We're going to do the cross section. So for example, this cross section is uh, uh, generated by the axis of cross section x. This plane over here, the red one, is perpendicular to x-axis. So we calculate this area ax and then integrate along the axis of cross-section, which is um, not written here, is written here, yeah, a to b, ax, dx, so that's going to be the volume, okay? Then um, let's think about the, what this the volume of uh, area of ax is going to be. ax is it's like integrated over this axis here, this line segment, which is parallel to y, so that must be dy integral, okay? And then it goes from y value c to y value d there. And over all that, we're integrating this curve right there, which is curve is still part of z equals f of x, y. And all these uh, values in this plane right here, x value is fixed. So we're treating this function here for x value fixed and y is varying. So that's the way we look at this function inside f of x, y. 
where x is fixed and y is varying, treated x as a constant, then it's going to be um, the value of this integral will depend on x. If you're plugging x equals 1, then integrate with respect to y, then x equals 2, then integrating with respect to y, there will be two different numbers. For each x value, this integral will turn out a different number. So that's why we have this notation ax. The area of that one, of that plate here, depend on where it was caught along, along the x-axis. Okay, the fun part is here is that we can put a different axis of uh, cross section and then you can do the same thing. So, for example, this one looked like this plate here is perpendicular to the y axis, therefore, y is the axis of cross section. Okay, so given y, so that's the entire points in this uh, red plate here, the y coordinate is the same. So given that y, what is this area of this part here? We can denote by by, like the like we did it before. This seems like integral over this horizontal part right there. That must be x values varying right there. So given y value, and this curve here treated as z equals f of xy, where y value is fixed. So here's y value is fixed, like y equals one then we're integrating over x values. So that's why there's a dx right here, and from a to b, integrating this function for actual value of y given. Each time if we have a different value y, maybe it was cutting right here or right over there, and we will have different integral values. So given y value, a different integral value will come out. It's a function of y. That by is the area of that one. So if you integrate by dy along you know the dy and the dc to d that will be the volume for this whole thing okay so different way of doing that and here the key statement to make is that volume of this one and volume of that one must be the same right if we believe this definition of cross section is well defined think about it if this definition of uh, cross-section definition is kind of weird because when we define a certain thing if it depends on different axis of cross-section you can stick it there but you can stick it in a different way like uh, you know put the rod vertically like that and go through the cross-section we can't define it like this because there are different ways of doing that why should that be the same because it's the same volume some might say but so we're in the process of defining something and we have to justify it. all this thing will result in the same value. So although we accepted it intuitively, this definition, it was really the method, not really the definition of volume. If someone can justify that everything is the same, that will make the definition well defined. But underneath this part, these two things, our thinking underneath our, our thinking that these two things will result in the same thing will rely on the well-definedness of the volume in this way, which is a lot of work, right? So make sure that you understand there's this gap in our logic to make this connection. So let me summarize it in this way. In Calc 3, we define using the Riemann sum, which involves a lot of different choices of partition and midpoints. That's difficult to understand why they're resulting the same. In a Calc 2 way, doing this cross-section, the difficulty is that you can put an axis of cross-section any way you want, to why they should you know, result in the same thing. Again, you can't use the argument like that there's the same volume. This is the process of defining the volume. We have to justify it in a different way they result in the same way. All right, so if we believe both things are well-defined, and they are equivalent, then we can conclude doing this um, so-called iterated integral and doing this way of iterating an integral must result in the same thing. If we believe these two uh, way of defining volume is equivalent. Right. right, that theorem I just stated is called the Fubini's theorem. We have this rectangle of size AB and CD like this 
doing this iterated integral, doing this integral uh, with respect to y first, treating x constant, therefore inside integral becomes a function of x. Then after that, we do this integral with respect to x is going to be equal to doing integral with respect to x first, treating y is constant. Then inside integral becomes a function of y. Then we do this integral y. These are called two different iterated integral. If you look at this left hand side and right hand side, it's just an object of integral to multiply, you know, iterated. Not necessarily we have to interpret it as a volume of anything. It's just one technical object here and technical object here. They're equal to each other. That can be one uh, version of Fubini's theorem. But if we interpret it as a volume of something, then and if we believe this cross-section method is equal to the double integral method, that should be equal to each other, uh, that should be equal to this double integral, therefore these two things must be equal to each other, right? So the full version of Fubini's theorem is stated in this way. All these three quantities must be equal to each other. Not only for these two variables, you can imagine there's a three iterated integral you can put with x and y and z. So if you label with a x1, x2, x3, x4, four variable cases, you can think about this iterated integral. From that point on, with many variables, then it's difficult to visualize where the volume of anything because it's high dimension. From that, we really have to rely on the mathematics, namely algebra and logics and, and, and so and so forth. Right. So doing this intuitive stuff rigorously using a uh, more algebraic or analytic way is a way to go for more variables. And those more variables have application, believe me. So the final bit I'd like to throw into this Fubini's theorem is that the condition, under what condition is this true, is this continuous. Right? If f is continuous, these three quantities is equal to, are equal to each other. More generally, because this two variable integral, what's involved is a, the more general condition is also is used, is very powerful. Um, if f is bounded and but discontinuous, continuous most of the time, discontinuous only on finite number of smooth curve. So if there's a curve inside of here, at that point, in, the, in that finite point, I mean the on that curve, one dimensional object, if the function behaves a little bit weird, you can kind of ignore that part. And as long as it behaves nicely in the rest of the part, which is most of the areas, and um, then it still exists. We're not going to that much of the detail here because it's there's not much more in there. It's just different treatment. You have to divide it into uh, tiny pieces such that it's kind of exclude that this smooth curve which overall has volume zero so we can ignore it and kind of stuff but it has to be done carefully at some point but not here it's going to take too much of our time and bound is also important but simply if f is continuous and we can show these three integrals are equal to each other right like i said last time the continuity of proving something under the condition of a continuous use a lot of uh, topological tools and flavor, especially the compactness, something called the compactness. That's the main tool in here. And that's going to be too much for us. And the most of the function we're going to deal with here is has um, this condition of a continuous partial, meaning that fx, fy, the partial x and partial y, as a function, they're a continuous function of two variables. Most functions are like that. So we're going to treat it like this. Why don't we consider continuously partial the function with the continuous partials and then show the Fubini's theorem. Okay? So in that case, we use mean value theorem and all the proof still has a lot of, you know, calculus, uh, low-level calculus flavor in it and that everything will make sense to you. In part one, this video is divided into part one and part two, in part one, we're going to show these two iterated integral are equal to each other. Not necessarily, you know, um, interpreting this as a volume of anything. Just look at this technical object and show use integral method to show these two things are equal to each other. And in part two, I'm going to show 
this cross-section method of calculating volume is equivalent to the double integral method of calculating volume. Once you establish that, and it doesn't matter which way you cross-section, therefore that will prove these three things are actually equal to each other. But that second method requires existence of this one and a little bit more. So it has um, advantage and disadvantage of you know, how complete uh, we can make our proofs. But first, in this video, part one, we're going to focus on these two connections. Like we did with the right after the Riemann sum, or a definition of the double integral, we're going to look at um, this function again. It's the same function, actually, and do the um, iterated integral. I'm going to go through iterated integral first and then kind of explain what happens later. Remember, this is the same function. If you do the double integral of that function here, something goes wrong and there are two different way of choosing um, the choice of a star point such that this Riemann sum turn out to be different values. Therefore, it doesn't exist. And the problem was caused by the one left corner down there is causing a problem because it's discontinuous. It actually blows up to infinity around it here in a quite crazy way, not like consistently going in here. There will be some path in here you can remain the function value like 2. But there is a subtle difference, a slightly different value, you can go to infinity. So that, uh, that's quite crazy down there. So that's the beginning of this iterated integral is written here. We're doing this one first. So x is given, and then we're doing this iterated integral with respect to y. So the choice of x here is a 0 to 1. And it turns out if it's a 0, it's slightly different. So we're, con um, we're assuming the given value x here is a non-zero. As long as x is non-zero, as y varies from 0 to 1, denominator will never be 0. You see x is a positive and y is not negative or 0 to something so this will be always positive. So this is well defined. That's why we're considering x equals non-zero first. Now from here is a little bit of uh, you know arrange, uh, arranging this numerator so that we can easily um, integrate. Usually we will change this x plus y. This main variable is y and x is a constant we'll make a substitution u equals x plus y and something like that. But I'm just doing this because it's simple, I'm doing it this way. x plus y appears there's a linear term if I arrange it like this. 2x minus x is the x. Negative y is y there. So I have x plus y in there. And if you separate this um, as a two sum of two fractions like this, then this x plus y, x plus y cancelled. So we have it here, and 2x is constant. And x plus y is linear, so we can compute the antiderivative right away. So here's the antiderivative. And the third power of y is the antiderivative of the second power in the denominator. And the second power in the denominator becomes the first power. So this is the antiderivative. Um, you may want to pause the video and do it yourself, and that's always a um, good way to appreciate mathematics. Do something you know, yourself. It's good part about part about this video. You can always pause and do some parts that we're undoing by yourself. All right, and then go from zero to one. There, these are the values of y. So plug in one there and subtract. Um, let's see. Yes, yeah, so it's one, and then there's a zero there. Okay. Then it turns out negative, negative, positive, and negative. This one over x part cancels. You can see this is the part that is causing the problem right there right when x approaches 0 but when it's not it just cancel off nicely and this is not happening in general this slice of you know the way this to slice the solid along the y-axis for is a very special way of doing it and for that special cut there's nice cancellations happening and that's why it gives one answer in a different way and a slightly different answer this blowing up to infinity kind of canceled off it here this particular way of slicing the solid. So it simplifies to this and as long as x is non-zero this makes perfect sense and that's going to be the inner integral. So let's consider the inner integral um, the same thing when x equals zero. When x is zero we have this. When x equals plug in zero 
and then we have negative y divided by y cubed. So that's 1 over y squared. Now there's a problem with y approaching 0. So when y equals 0, this function here is undefined. Therefore, we are looking at this one as an improper integral. y is approaching from the right to the 0. There, OK? So it's written like this as an improper integral. I'm missing dy down there. Sorry about that. But if you do this integral, it's going to be 1 over y. And as the, the one of the term approaches 0 in the denominator, it's obvious that approaches negative infinity. So this inner integral as a function of x, when x equals 0, is undefined. OK, so look at this inner integral. It's undefined at one point from 0 to 1. What do we do? Just like we did it here, we have to look at this as an inner an improper integral. And that's the meaning of this notation, right? There's no improper integral, seemingly, but as you read stripping off, there's that's the only way to make sense out of this notation right here, everything. This is undefined at zero, so we're looking at this improper integral. This is careful analysis. Again, inside integral when x equals zero is um, undefined. Therefore, we're looking at this outer integral there as an improper integral at that zero. So we have to actually um, define ax like this, which is inner integral ax, depending on x, that when x is non-zero, it was a clean value like this, when x equals zero is undefined. But you can change it to one that behaves continuously when x approaches zero, then integrating will be the same as a treating as improper integral. All right? So I wrote it up here. So let's proceed. We just dealt with this inner integral there. Let's proceed the, the last bit. So we replace with ax as ax is defined in this way. Or you can treat it as ax and add a0 is undefined. That's fine. The improper integral still takes care of it. But I made it simple like this. Then what is the at this ax value? And it is consistent when this one with an x equals 0 is really 1. So everything can be just uh, treated like this, 1 over x plus 1 squared. Then it's um, antiderivative is negative 1 over x plus 1, and 1 to 0, and the value is 1 half. Again, I want you to try this last bit a little bit yourself, but it's 1 half. OK, we've got the value. So I summarize it up here. So how about the other one? Whew. I'm going to go through all this thing again, but actually, no. It's nice symmetry allows us to calculate this simply. So here is x minus y, sorry about the messy part. dx first, dy later, that's, we just did this one, so we're doing this one right there. Okay? So, um, I can swap this y and x and pull a negative out. It's a basic property of the integral. And next thing I'm doing is using the dummy variable. It doesn't matter what this x and y is denoted. I'm going to call this xt and ys. So x was t, so x got t there y was s, so y get t there. The down there, s plus c, t plus s doesn't matter. So it's it's like this. Now from here, you can switch it again. Doesn't matter what this t and s is called, right? You can call this one um, y, and we can call this one x, and then rewrite this one with an x and y. So let's see, then t equals y, x equals x, t equals y, where the t equals y there and y there, s equals x, s is appearing here, s is appearing there x, therefore this is exactly the same as that one, except that there is a negative sign. Therefore, treating x and y as a dummy variable, this whole thing must be just simply negative one half. So if you do this integral, that must be negative one half right there. So let me explain what just happened. So this is the picture. This is where the you know, discontinuity happens. And then I showed that earlier, this symmetry at a comma b and b comma a. And this function right here has this opposite sign across it. So they cancel each other. The value cancel each other. So I'm looking at this iterated integral. So this we're integrating along y there. So this is dy. So this is along y. So suppose we're integrating all the way like this. So we're looking at this one, dy first. Okay? But x value just stopped right here. So x is not going from 0 to 1. y is going from 0 to 1. 
but x is going only from some delta to 1 here. So I'm treating this one, getting rid of that 0, and changing it to delta. So the, the value of an iterated integral from delta to 1, 0 to 1, will be the, the volume over this side to the right of this red line. Because of the symmetry, the integral value of, our, of this triangular region up here and there will cancel out. So what is left out is this value. And think about what happened as we push this delta to zero. So that will be very tiny region down there. This purple or blue horizontal line will be almost down there in the bottom. And let me guarantee you this portion as this one, this width here or height gets smaller and smaller. It's very, very small. Um, volume over there but as this as we close to that portion right there this picks up the huge because it blows up to infinity picks up a huge volume but somewhat the way we strip in and off they nicely cancel off and become a, some number so it was a positive and but if you do it the other way around it's about this corner right there not the lower corner from that 45 degree line and the upper corner from that 45 degree line picks up, actually blows down to infinity. So it picks up a negative region. So that's what happened around there. And that's what this um, iterated integral picked up. All right. It's really fun to, so maybe we should really look at this with the Mathematica. But uh, it's actually less confusing. But it's uh, you can do it yourself and put this one in the Mathematica, see what really what's going on. But I find that this is a better analysis than looking at the picture that really tells you what's going on to this iterated integral. All right?